how we do it. Brett Jones, welcome to LinkedIn Heroes. How are you? Good morning. I'm great, thank you. How are you? Yeah, doing great, doing great. Um, everyone tuning in on YouTube and LinkedIn, we've got Brett Jones in the house. Please drop in the comments, let us know which city you're tuning in from. Um, we want to make this as interactive as possible. Welcome to jump in and ask questions as we go. Brett's got an awesome uh, welcome, Lacey, there you are. <laughs> welcome, Lacey. Um, drop in the comments, guys. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Say hello. Uh, we'll bring your comments up on the screen here. Uh, Brett and I have known each other now for well, only about six months or so, but we've had quite a lot of time together. I've been fortunate enough to come along to a few of Brett's events, uh, Relationship Warriors, The Code, and I've also done his Warrior Man Crucible, which everyone in my network has loved hearing about. And so we went to talk a bit about that. Um, so to hear a bit more about your journey in business. A lot of the people tuning in are entrepreneurs, business owners, and um, I think they're going to get a lot of inspiration from hearing your story about building a business um, up to the size of 400 million, going through the process of losing all the things you learned on the other side, rebuilding your wealth, and now you've got your, you know, several different businesses. Um, but before we get into that, I'd, I'd love to know just from your perspective, Brett, who was who was Brett growing up? Like if we were classmates, say 10, 10 years old, uh, what kind of guy were you growing up? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, for all of us, we we're very different when we we're younger and I'd be unrecognisable. I think I was, uh, I think it's sort of hard to have perspective on yourself, but I was certainly the, the shy guy um, in the class. I think there was always an element in myself that was looking for more. And up until I was about maybe 12, 13, I'd be the shy guy, um, I wouldn't say much in class. Had a good group of friends that I'd hang around with. But when I got to 13, 14, um, through serendipity or just fate, I went and saw a Bruce Lee movie. And I remember it was in the history hall, it was like a cinema downstairs, a little dingy, you know, dark little hole down there. And I went and saw this Bruce Lee movie, this martial arts movie. And I was just blown away. It was just like, oh, my God, I, I want to do that. And um, I started in, they didn't have Kung Fu classes back then in Perth. I don't think anyone knew what that was. So they had karate classes. So I went and did some karate classes. And um, I was so passionate about it that uh, I went five, five times a week. So for the first uh, five days, it was during the week, I'd catch the bus in after school, do the karate class, come home, do my homework, et cetera. And then obviously in the weekends, you know, I was working as well. So try to work, I'd, I'd go into the, the class. And it upped my fitness level substantially. Um, so that carried across into football and other things, cricket, et cetera, that I was doing. So I actually became quite good at those. And that increased confidence. Mm. And just doing karate increases your confidence. You feel like you can handle yourself. But I was still introverted. You know, and came out of school and, like most people, didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I picked three, three main choices to go to university after school. The first two were around uh, physical education. So I was heading towards being a teacher or something like that. Didn't get the marks, but got enough marks to get into university to do um, a diploma valuation, real estate valuation. And that's how I ended up taking taking that path, right? Quite bizarre, really, because I had no intention of doing it. It's just it was like, well, what am I going to do? And someone said, well, one of my um, aunties said, well, look, your cousin's doing real estate valuation. He's a valuer of the city of Perth. Why don't you go in and see what he does? So I went in and hung around from you know half an hour with him. Well, yeah, whatever. Just put it down as a third option. Suddenly, <laughs> next minute, life changed. Fantastic. So you fell into to studying real estate valuation. How did that lead into you starting your own business in the in the property or building industry? Yeah. So I was working at um, straight after right. school and um, met my um, then wife, my first wife, and. Um, 
we saved up and went overseas for three months and blew back then $10,000, which was pretty much equivalent to like 40 or 50 now. <laughs> and so it was a lot of money. And we went on a three-month trip across the US, Canada, et cetera, came back. She was pregnant. So I started working at Curtin University from midnight to six in the morning cleaning floors. And during the day I was studying. About halfway through that year, I applied for a couple of jobs and got a job at a company called Joseph Charles Leamoth Duffy. Uh, quite a mouthful. But um, I was looking after residential real estate, doing the house inspections and things like that. And an opportunity came up from one of the clients where he had developed this uh, group of uh, units in Como, just near the um, South Perth uh, Golf Club. And then it released out. So there was 10 odd units. And they put me in charge of that. So I organized, you know, all the bunting of the flags and the big sign and just did it on weekend and leased them all. The client was extremely happy. And I guess they sort of went, oh, okay, this, this guy's got a bit of flair about him, seems to know what he's doing. So they gave me an opportunity to start uh, in office leasing. And this was back when the iron ore boom was just taking off. Allendale Square, um, City Centre, AMP building had just been constructed, the first 30-storey buildings in Perth. So there was heaps of office space to lease. And um, I was living in Willerton at the time. I can't remember what I was driving, but some shit car. And I suddenly started making a lot of money. Like, I made a lot of money. And within a year, I'd moved from Willerton. Um, by this stage, we had two kids. Uh, to a house in Netherlands. So gone from, at that stage, I think it was about a $30,000 house to a $100,000 house in, in Netherlands. So three times the amount. Bought myself a, a little three-series BMW. Because um, my ego by this stage, of course, was running completely out of control. Right? <laughs> Just off my head in, in pure ego. Um, and thought I was, you know, bulletproof. But it was, it was good timing and that the market, So, and I think this is a really important business lesson, right? I was in the right place at the right time. The market was going nuts. There was massive opportunity there. The economy was booming with the iron ore boom. Um, new companies were expanding, moving into the new buildings. So it, it was a time to really harvest the crops. And I did. and did extremely, extremely well. Ended up um, buying a share of the company as well right. and then um, there was a few things going on with the boss at the time and let's say he wasn't probably the nicest person to work for not the most ethical person to work for and I didn't like where things were going um, there was a couple of things where we got basically cheated out of money that we should have been paid and things like that that were going on but when I was still working in the residential um, uh, property management area, I was sent out to a little button shed in the back of Como to find this file for, for, for the boss. And the, the company by this stage was quite big. There's probably about 50 of us, plus there was residential branches as well. So it's like over 100 employees in the company. And um, I was still a shit kick. I was running around doing all these minor tasks like, like that. And I was piling through all this stuff in there trying to find this goddamn file he'd asked me to look for. And whilst I was looking, I came across this other um, binder. And I was just looking through it and just somehow got interested in just opening up and reading it. And I saw in there that he bought this property in Stirling Highway in Netherlands. And Westpac Bank wanted to um, get a new branch in that location. So we've done a deal with Westpac, and then we're also going to put one of our real estate uh, offices in there so the whole thing would be leased. But he didn't have enough money personally to be able to finance the loan. So he went to the state manager of one of our clients, uh, a big insurance company, and said, look, I've got land, I've got the tenants, you give me the money and we'll do a 50-50 joint venture. And I went, wow, that's, that's a great idea. It's a really great idea. That's an easy way to make money. Yeah. And 
I think what I was doing, using some business principles here, uh, Nathaniel, is yeah. I was apprenticing in how to make money in real estate. I was getting expertise in one of the three main areas that you can, which is real estate, um, investing in stocks, or starting a business. Mm. And, you know, we, we learn by modelling. So I was watching my boss learning good and bad things from them, from my bosses. Yeah. Um, but I also found one method. And I saw things like um, I moved on from office leasing to selling commercial buildings as well. And I was selling this shopping centre down in Albany called Dog Rock. And this was a shopping centre. The guy that I sold it to, I managed to help him finance it so he put zero dollars in. I mean, nothing. Put down a $5,000 deposit on the contract. We got the first mortgage, second mortgage, and third mortgage for the total value of the property. And just a week prior to settlement, he says to me, oh, Brett, I've got a problem. And as a commission real estate agent, the last thing you want to hear is, um, a week before settlement, where you've already spent the commission that you've made, right? You've already spent it. Yeah. Um, that this guy has a problem. And go, oh, yeah, okay, so what, what's the problem? He says, I don't have the stamp duty. And I'm thinking, God's sake, like, we finance the thing. You've got all the money here, right, to buy the goddamn shopping centre with zero dollars in, and you don't even have the stamp duty. And he had businesses um, importing German furniture into Western Australia and, and uh, distributing and selling it. So I'm racking my brains thinking, like, can't you go to your auntie or somebody for 100 grand? Because that's how much the stamp duty was. Um, it's $100,000. And his answer was no. So I went to Perrin, who was the owner of the shopping centre at the time, and said to him, look, the guy's got all the money. Um, he's managed to borrow. Interest rates are eighteen percent, but Stan was so desperate to get rid of this property. So here's another principle: always look for someone who is desperate for whatever reason to sell their property. In other words, buy it at a discount, buy it substantially below its real value. So John was going to buy this. The income was four hundred grand a year. There was still vacancy, so he's buying it at uh, a twenty percent. Uh, return on his money. This was a massive return, like really, really high. Yeah. And the interest on the full amount of the loan was going to be um, 200 grand. So he was making a surplus of $200,000 a year. So I said to Stan, look, he'll give you a fourth mortgage. And every month for the first six months, he'll divert all that cash to you and pay off the stamp duty. And Stan was so desperate for his property he didn't want it, he agreed. So John bought it, bought a $2 million shopping centre for zero, kept it for five years, made a surplus of 200 grand a year, so he made a million bucks in surplus and sold it for $2.8 million five years later. Wow. Wow. So there's a few things there, zero right? Like, yeah, I mean, you, you've... you've taken on this role you've you've learned as you say as an apprentice apprentice learning yep. from others in the industry but then you've got this knack to be able to look at what some might see as a very impossible situation and think outside the box and look for creative solutions within that is that something that you think just comes naturally or is that something that you developed over time the skill you developed? as i said i think you know we when we're little, we model in three ways. We take the culture, events that happen to us, and role models that we have in life. Mostly parents, obviously, but sometimes grandparents, aunties, uncles, bosses. So when I think back and I you know, look at it, I would say that that skill came from watching my bosses. He wasn't a good person, morally, but there were certainly good things business-wise about him. And one of those was that he would think outside the box. He was quite entrepreneurial, this old company, got all the old directors to move out and he eventually acquired all their interests and ended up owning the company himself. So that's where I think that ability to, to look at that came from, like modelling them going, okay, how can, how can I make this happen? So the next part of the story is I get 
um, the, the company now becomes part of Collier's International, which is a started in Australia but became an international real estate uh, conglomerate. One of the largest. Oh, was that an Australian company? I didn't realize. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the actual guy Collier um, was a, a Sydney guy and started right. up Collier's in Sydney, expanded to Melbourne, Brisbane, and um, West Australia and Adelaide, and then they expanded in the states and etc. around the world. So. When we joined them, they needed a leasing guy in Melbourne. They didn't have a leasing department. So they made an offer. I agreed to pick my family up and we moved to Melbourne. I get to Melbourne and I get a letter on my desk. And it, it's, West, it's from West Bank, same bank, right? That was in the file. And they're looking to decentralise out of Melbourne into suburban locations. Now, if I hadn't seen the file... Hadn't had a conversation with the guy that bought the shopping centre um, down in Albany. That letter would have gone in the bin because it's related to suburban stuff. I'm handling city, not suburban. So it would have just been there. And when I saw the letter, what kicked in was, hang on, here's an opportunity. This is exactly what I saw in the file, even the same bank for that take. So I went through the suburbs and found a site out at Ringwood in Melbourne. And I got an option on the site for about three months. Did due diligence on it from the owner. Bought it well, same as I'd seen in that shopping centre. Then I went to John, the guy that bought the shopping centre in Melbourne, and said, look, you know, let me talk about in Perth. Uh, I found this opportunity. I've got the land. I think I can get the tenant. Can you organise the money? And he said, uh, I don't know. I'll give you a call back. So he rings me back in about a week or so. In the meantime, I've got a commitment from Westpac to lease the site for 10 years for a new 2,000 square meter office building. And John says, look, I've got a company he's worth about 80 million. He'll put the money in. So we'll go one third, one third, one third. Exactly like I saw, exactly like I saw in that file. And I think this is this is a key thing that I see a lot of people that they don't do, Nathaniel. They don't master um, one method, one way of doing something, whether it's in real estate or business or on the stock market. Like if you look at Warren Buffett, one method. Warren's method is buy and hold. His perfect yeah. company is when you buy and you never ever sell. He just he just perfected that. Yeah. And I think that's one of the key if you want to be successful in life is find a method. So for me, development um, is not real estate investing. That's different. Real estate investing is something I learned later. Real estate development is a business. Yeah. It's generating income, large amounts of income, lumpy income. You don't get it for two years. Um, but it's a business. Um, Brett, just bear with me a sec. I'm just going to re you to the stream hang on sure I think that might work a bit better um um yeah so so what is what are some of the mistakes that you think you made along the way what did you learn from the experience heaps, <laughs> heaps of mistakes <laughs> like i'd never developed a building before so i had no idea about building contracts i had no idea about um a little bit of an idea about architects because i'd worked with some on the office leasing in perth but again, I, um, I figured it out, right? It's just like, okay, you need a contract to build. Um, what I didn't do on the first one is I didn't have it as a fixed price contract. So when I got to the end of the building, I did a lot of things right. I pre-leased the building. I didn't commit to the site until I got the tenant signed up. I got the finance organized and I had the money. Yep. Um, put in place a building contract, but I didn't make it fixed price. So that was a big mistake on the first one. And at the end, we ended up caught uh, the builder. We ended up having to pay a little bit of money to him, nowhere near what he claimed uh, to get out of that. So I learned from that. The next ones after that, it was all, all fixed price. Um, I set up criteria. I said to myself, coming out of Western Australia, we must economy, do not develop in that economy. That would be a mistake. It's so boom and bust. Do stuff in Melbourne, which is a much more secure, bigger city, more stable maybe even Sydney, maybe even Brisbane, but not in Perth. It's too up and down. Um, I broke those rules. Hmm. So I set the rules up to begin with. I also knew 
Um, I could read the market and I saw what happened in Perth, boom and bust. And I could see, you know, when I was developing. So the next building I did, uh, I was still working for colleagues at the time, and we, the guy that financed the Westpac office building in Ringwood, then went, that was great. Um, let's go again. So I said, fantastic. Yeah, let's, let's, let's go again. And there was a site uh, near Parliament House in Melbourne, an old abandoned um, uh, synagogue that a developer had accidentally uh, dropped a match in the middle of, and even though it was classified, it burnt down. So all that was left was the facade of it, but you had to retain that. So we did a design, retain the facade, build the office building, 10 storeys behind. It's going to cost $16 million. You can bear in mind that I'm 22 years of age, Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm 22. Yeah. So I've just done this building, uh, made about $180,000 when the average uh, wage back then was like uh, about $40,000. Yeah. So it was a lot of money. And um, we bought the site for $2 million. Bucks. So applied the rules, um, ends been transferred $2 million. So own the site but own it outright. No, no debt on the site. Then go to Westpac um, and go, look, it's going to cost $16 million to put it there. Uh, we want to borrow 14 So they agree to finance an office building for $14 bucks to a 22-year-old <laughs> working for Coley's International um, with no personal guarantees from me, from Edmund, or from John. Mm. Like just because that that is part of the cycle of the market, like banks will ease up their lending criteria at times. Hmm. So they agree to do it. They financed this for $14 million, put it out for tender whilst we were building it, um, didn't follow my formula in having it pre lease which could have been a massive mistake, right? But it was in a boom period, Nathaniel. So the thing about booms is they cover up a lot of mistakes. It was valued at 18.5 million. So we're going to make about two and a half million on it. And we put it out to tender October 1987. The day the stock market fell 40% was the day the tender closed. And one of the tenderers was a stockbroker from Melbourne. And he withdrew his tender on that day for obvious reasons. The other three, um, we ended up selling it to Mercantile Mutual Insurance Company for $21.5 million. Mm. So we made um, nearly $6 million bucks on it. Wow. And this so whole time I, you're still working for Colliers? I got a check for $1.8 million when the average wow. wage was forty grand. So, did so you get a job? Uh, being young and dumb and stupid... <clears throat> I um, set up my own company oh, yeah. called it Dayton and um, then went to look for other partners and I found a Japanese construction company that would finance a development 100%, no money in from me. And then I used the same formula on a shopping centre up at um, Ballarat where I had Maya, department store, Coles um, and Target committed the shopping center 30 million dollar development they financed it all and when the one for 21.5 had finished we rolled that money in another one for 70. so within uh, a space of about three years i'm 26 years of age and i've got 400 million dollars worth of development going on wow with the three states using yeah. that basic basic formula mm. that's what's possible that's what's possible yeah. And so do, do you think you grew too fast? We didn't grow too fast. I made errors, you know, like the question that you asked me. So I went back to yeah. Perth. I had this deal offered to me where the State Government Insurance Commission was uh, dead keen to get out of some property. So criteria number one. Yeah. It was a bargain. I could put $100,000 down, run the ball, and a six-month option on it. I knew that there was three components to it. There was three buildings on St. George's Terrace, the Palmini Hilton Hotel, and a vacant site down on Mounts Bay Road. Yeah. 
but I knew that the sum of those three was much more than what we were going to pay for. Yeah. And so when you had $400 million worth of projects under, under, on, on the go, um, mm. did you have any staff? doesn't sound like you needed to. <laughs> and the, thing about, uh, the development business is you don't need a lot of staff to yeah. manage it or control it. <clears throat> you know, it's mostly working with um, consultants and a builder. So we had a, a couple of guys in uh, an office in Melbourne. I'd moved back to Perth. So John, myself, our uh, controller, uh, who was an ex Arthur Anderson accountant that we brought across to manage right. that. And we had another project manager in Perth that was looking after our stuff in Perth and in Queensland from there. That yeah, was it. Cool. Right. And, and so then, you know, obviously did you, did you um, that business – um, due to the you know the project in Perth and mistakes that were made, it kind of what would you say uh, um, fell apart, didn't it? Yeah. So with that site that we bought, we managed to sell the hotel and the three office books and ended up with the site. Yeah. yeah. And we owned the site freehold, so we'd made enough money on splitting enough that we owned the site freehold. The mistake that we made was that I made was. We went ahead and borrowed twenty million against the forty million dollar value of the site, and used that those funds to go and do another development in Queensland gotcha. and one in Perth. Yeah, and interest rates then went from ten percent to eighteen. Right. We were paying out five million bucks a year over three years, so it sucked yep. fifteen million dollars in interest payments out. Yeah. So, so what have you done differently since then? So that all collapsed, um, and the worst thing about it collapsing was that once one development goes down because they're cross-collateralized, it brings the whole thing down. Mm. So when you do a loan, it basically says if you personally or any companies you're associated with um, go into default, it defaults the loan. So it literally was a, like a domino effect across everything. That we were doing. Yeah. So it all went down. Um, and the worst thing out of that is, uh, you know, I lost my marriage. That means I got to see my kids every second weekend. Um, it was a disaster. And that's where I started getting into uh, personal development and, and beginning to realise, just beginning to realise, that having great amounts of money or fame um, is not fulfilling. There's something else that you need. And having a great marriage, having a great relationship, um, focusing in on the family as the primary purpose of what you're doing because people very easily get lost in business and chasing wealth. Nothing wrong with that, but if you don't have these other components and including um, you know, in yourself, like being good with you and how you show up in life, yeah. how you come across in life, realising you do have an ego. And if you don't care, it will control you rather than you control it. Yeah. So that was the, the beginning. So um, that collapsed me down, got divorced, uh, spent a couple of years uh, soul searching, um, met my gorgeous wife, Marie, who I've now been with for 27 years. And um, together we decided we were going to sell um, what we had. So from a business point of view, I had to start again from scratch. I uh, had a acre farm in 2J, which um, in my guilt, I agreed to leave to my ex-wife. <laughs> so um, I had zero, and I mean zero. I used my last 7,000 bucks to buy this she stick shift board with a bench seat in the front so I could fit all the kids in. And it was a shit heap because it fell to pieces within about uh, a year. And... Um, I was looking for a job and right. no real estate agency would uh, employ me because when I went down, it was quite spectacular. I was on the evening news all across the country. Uh, everybody knew me. They'd known me before that, but now they knew me uh, infamous. Well. And yeah. no one would employ me. They were like, mm, look, you know, you'd probably be good, but um, I don't think our clients would like to deal with you. Mm. But one guy did give me an opportunity. 
and commission and put me on a very small base and uh, put me on commission. And I met a guy who was in a similar circumstance to me under pressure, um, owned a 10 shopping centres, but um, he, his LVL ratio was out. The values had dropped. He had more than enough excess cash flow, but the banks were putting him under a lot of pressure. So I could relate to him. He could relate to me. So I helped him out. Uh, we managed to sell up a number of shopping centres. Uh, I made a shitload of money doing it and ended up actually going to work for him on the final shopping centre and helping him to redevelop that. We then, um, Marie and I, um, I'd also done a couple of smaller developments on that shopping centre on some external sites there. So again, using the formula, own the site, get the tenants, use the exactly the same thing again, begin again. Yep, yep, yep. And then Marie and I took three years off and went overseas, travelling around the world and got. Yeah, beautiful. Well, there's this, there's this um, you know, on Instagram and on YouTube, a lot of the content creators on there, the entrepreneurs are, are speaking to the to these young entrepreneurs. And there's this big thing about you got to work hard. It's, it's all about hustle and yep. you know, there's 20 hours in a day and blah, blah, blah. You sleep when you're dead. What would what would you say to those young entrepreneurs that are starting out in business about all of that? That's all shit. <laughs> Being um, you know in the sixties now and, and looking back, I, I think yes, in, in your twenties you want to work hard. You know that's that's a time to set yourself up, but you've got to have balance with that. Like there's no point like myself and many others that that you know Nathaniel as well as I that have blown up their marriages. And the problem is you got to you're going to fail, you're going to make mistakes but you want to minimise those as much as possible. And one mistake you don't want to make is in your relationship because the shit show you've got to clean up after that takes you out of the game for, for ages and ages. So you're actually going yeah. backwards, like massively, if you don't have the skills to look after that part of your life. Yourself, um, in terms of your mindset and your emotions, your control over yourself is primary. If you can do yeah. that... You can control the other things. And as, you know, you said, you've done some of my events in, in the public, in the uh, Crucible event. You know, one of the things yeah. we talk about, if you're working 20 hours a day, you're, excuse the language, you're just fucking inefficient. <laughs> you're just inefficient. Like you're not delegating. Um, you're not clear on your objectives. You're not putting it out where you need to put it out to make sure you're not working 20 hours a day. You don't need to do that to be successful. That is not the method. You want to find one method, you want to perfect it, and you want to create a structure in business where you're delegating and you've got balance. So one of the things I did right, Nathaniel, when I came back is I did a lot of work on myself when I came back from overseas. Yeah. You get a lot of time to contemplate and think about life and yourself um, whilst you're on your trip across the ocean in the middle of nowhere. 3,000 miles from anywhere. So I think that's, that's, a big, that's a good point because you've got to get crystal clear on what you want. If you're going to do one thing and that's going to be, you know, if, if you don't know what you want to do and you're still trying lots of different things, it's very easy to spend those 20 hours a day. And I agree. I think right now it's very easy to try a lot of things. Do I, do I go online and, you know, set up an eBay shop or... Do, do I just go into marketing, uh, you know, physical products or intellectual products or what line of business do I go into? Like there's so much talk about that. And there are many methods uh, to, to achieve that, particularly in business right now. Yeah. In, in property, you know, not, not so much. Um, in, in the stock market, you know, with crypto and, and lots of other opportunities, which one do I go into? Mm. There's no easy answer to that. I, I think what you have to do is you have to pick one and then really work hard to, to perfect that, that method of, yeah. of how you do that. And in some respects, there's another perspective on it. So I went into selling to begin my career. Now, I didn't think about this until like 20 or 30 years later, but I suddenly realised when I was looking at myself and being introspective, Holy crap, I apprenticed to my father. My dad was the same. Right. 
And I'd never connected the dots, right? I'd never connected that all those years growing up with him, I'd been unconsciously watching and apprenticing to his mode of behavior and how he was. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And yeah. Coming back from overseas, one of the things that became blaringly obvious again on the yacht is that those principles that I'd set up that I broke, and this is where most people run into problems in business. I see it all the time. Is that you don't stick to what your gut you know is right. You listen to your head. So when I did that deal on that $100 million site, my gut was screaming, like literally screaming at me, don't do this. You said you weren't going to do this. Yes, it's a great deal, but just don't do it. And I ignored it. And on the yacht, when you did that, if you set up a rule such as you don't leave in a weather window where you know there's bad weather coming, there's a weather window five days, you think you're going to make it four, you're going to get there in four, you don't do that. Because what can happen is the weather happens on the third day. Yeah. So whenever we broke that rule, there would be an immediate consequence on the ocean, immediate. So I learned, and I reinforced what I'd learned before in business. So when I came back and I started up again, so over the next few years coming back, I did about another $50 million worth of developments. <clears throat> I did um, you know, four, four different buildings couple of showrooms, uh, uh, apartments in Como, uh, Erskine Shopping Centre in Mandra, etc. Again, using the same formula, Erskine was the first one I did, um, got the site, got an option on it, got Coles to commit to it, uh, went to Luke Saraceni and did a joint venture uh, with him. So exactly the same formula. Uh, apartments in Como, buy the land outright uh, with a syndicate of investors, pre-sell the apartments before we started went in and did the development. Mm -hmm. Went up perfectly, no problem at all. Uh, showrooms, get the site, lease them up before we start, go ahead and develop them. And this time we did sell them. And that was the beginning of me turning from a real estate developer, so going from being a business owner as a developer to becoming an investor. And very different principles involved in those two things that I think it's if you're in business, yep. as we talk about in the in the crucible, so to use your business in your early years, 30s, 40s, and then start to transition across to using excess cash flow out of business to becoming an investor. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks for dropping in the comments, guys. I've just want to give a shout out to Lewis in Bangkok. We've got Rebecca tuning in. Christopher's over in Fingal Bay, New South Wales. We've got someone in from Mexico. It's great to have people from all around the world. Hey, Tom, how are you? Apologize if it's been a bit choppy throughout. I think the audio has been clear, so hopefully you guys can still carry along. Um, so, Brett, let's talk about this Warrior Man Crucible. Um, mm -hmm. it's, one of, it's been an amazing experience for me. Um, when my friends at dinners have asked me, what did you go down there? What did that involve? And I tell, tell them what's involved. And they say to me, oh, geez, okay. Yeah, what, what's the purpose behind that? And I have to explain it, raising yeah. your standards. But for the men that are tuning in, I know there's a few men that have dropped in the comments. Can you explain to us what are the mistakes that men are making in business, we, we've kind of covered off a couple of them. And then why did you come up? How did you come up with the idea to create this, this week of SAS mayhem mixed in with personal development just for men? I've never seen anything like it. You explain a bit about it and how you came up with the idea. Yeah. Look, as you, as you know, having done our relationship code, we talk about um, the, what's happened with men over the last 50, 60 years since World War II. You know, our fathers, most of us don't have an appreciation for it these days as to what actually occurred culturally back then. You know, we're not used to an environment like in the Ukraine right now where everything just gets tipped upside down. Suddenly all the men um, back in World War II were off at war. And I'm talking 85% of men in, in working age in Australia were involved in the war effort. So you and I wouldn't be having this conversation right now. We'd be off somewhere fighting a war. 
and most of the men listening would be as well. And I have to think about it in terms of here's a complete generation of men around the world now trained for three months to pick up a weapon, go onto a battlefield and kill. And so you form these bonds with the brothers around you. You go off to war and suddenly you're piling off a ship in some godforsaken land or jumping in an aeroplane or whatever and there are bullets flying past you by that you got really close to, suddenly disappears in a spray of pink mist as a bomb hits him and he explodes and, and just is gone. The guy on the other side of you, his head just fragments into nothing and you're meant to carry on. How do you do that? Well, emotionally, you learn to shut it off, block it out. And a whole generation of men learn how to do that. And when they came back, they continued to do it. And meanwhile, at home, the women had to step up and handle everything. I mean everything. Pay the bills, look after the kids, uh, send them off to school, look after their mum, look after his mum, because he's off a wall. Look after everybody and everything. And a whole generation of women became conditioned to do that. So the next generation modelled that behaviour. So now we've got this generation of men in relationships, shutting down, blocking off, not really engaging in conversation. It's too much. Can't handle it. Let's just block off. Block off, walk away. So we go from pre-World War II, divorce rate around the world, 10% in most countries to 40% immediately after. Not because divorce suddenly became legal, because it didn't become legal in the States and here in Australia until the 1960s. But suddenly in the late 1940s, we've got a divorce rate of 40%. Marriages were no longer working because the dynamic completely changed from what it used to be. He'd go out to work, she'd take care of home. That's how it was. Now, in the generation we've got now, men and women are equal, and rightly so. But we're not the same. For millions of years, we've never been the same. We're completely different. So suddenly now we've got a 60% divorce rate, and it's simply not working. So if you're a businessman, one of the areas you need to take care of is home. But the way you're doing it, the way you show up at home, is too much focus on business, not enough presence and attention at home, and that has consequences for kids, for you, because if you have to clean that mess up, you cut out a couple of years at least in cleaning it up, which you have to do with. Plus, yeah. it goes at least half your wealth anyway. So, at brother, least. all those years you just spent not looking after that area has just cost you massively. So the concept behind the code event and the crucible is we need new skills. School, school doesn't provide to us, Nathaniel. A university doesn't provide these skills. Our brothers don't provide these skills because they don't know them. And certainly our fathers didn't because they didn't know them either. So we need a new education. So coming into the crucible, as, as you well saw and experienced, right, there's, um, there's a certainty that men need to get back that we can bring in business, but generally we can't bring across the other areas of our life. A certainty around being able to show up emotionally in a particular way. And, and some guys can't do it in business either. So they need it in business as well, where you don't have to be disrespectful, but you have to be absolutely certain of what you want in this deal and know exactly how to get it, know when to back off, when to push forward in negotiation and how to handle objections and work your way past those objections to get to a win-win situation. Yeah. So the concept in the crucible is if you want to improve your emotional state and your mindset, that is connected to your body. Mm. So when we push brothers in the crucible at a body level, it has an impact emotionally and in their mindset. How much change someone's mindset and their emotions is hard work. It's been conditioned yeah. over years and years. You know, as you as you know, some people just turn up with not enough confidence. Yeah. Some people turn up with too much confidence, too much ego. Yeah. 
So the crucible deals with those sorts of life skills that show up in business and either um, slow us down or cause us to fail to business. Yeah. Yeah. And I th- yeah. I mean, it, when I started out in business, it was like if, if I had a big win, you know, I, I would be quite quiet about it. A lot of my mates were working for other people. You know, it didn't, it's a, that tall poppy syndrome came into yeah. a, a effect. And it was almost like in some instances you'd get reward for, for rewarded for not, you know, being too successful. You know, if you, if you didn't have a great day, it's like, all right, mate, let's have a beer together. And you, you in society and families, we kind of get rewarded for being mediocre. It's not yeah. very, not, there's not many environments where, um, you are held to a higher standard. And that's one of the big things that I got from spending the time with you at the, the warrior man crucible, raising your standards is something I've heard Tony Robbins talk a lot about, but yeah. being in there doing that, you know, that physical training that we were doing and not only the physical training, also the, the emotional stuff as well. It's like, well, you know, hang on, you know, if there's bullshit, we're going to call you on it. And I just got so much from that and being able to, to, to take it into my my life as this is a very very unique experience but i can imagine it's very difficult to try to, to try to market and explain to people because it's, well, it's not till you're there and you experience it that you see the value in doing all this stuff yeah all the concepts you know the concept you're referring to there is the concept we have of uh, lying to yourself and what i explained before when it came to a hundred million dollar deal I was doing that. I was lying to myself. I'd set up this principle. I said something in my head. I'm not such a great deal. I can't let this go. But I was lying to myself. And often we lie to ourselves about how well we're doing. We lie to ourselves about the mistakes that we make. And holding ourselves accountable to those lies, if we don't, it just causes us massive problems. You know, when we make a mistake, Cleaning up that crap later, the energy effort it takes, not just personally, but in the enterprise to do that, is massive. Yeah. And then you've got this catch up here. It's like Warren Buffett talks about number one rule, don't lose money. Number two rule, follow number rule, number one. Why? Because in a return sense, as you're going up, if you lose money, and suddenly you're back down here having to make up that difference again just to get back to where you were, it's the same in business. When you make that mistake, and having a brotherhood of men who will call you on your crap is very, very useful. It's the whole concept of a board, but the problem with boards is they don't have that standard in the board. Hang on, what you're saying right now? Sorry, but that's just crap. That's just not real. Mm-hmm. Everyone's polite, you know. We've got issues, and everybody's about it, worrying about upsetting each other and patting each other on the back on how well they're doing instead of looking at the shell and calling crap in the boardroom. Yeah. That is essential. So we've created that concept um, in the follow-up brotherhood of we have these meetings, we talk about what's going on, and we will call each other when there is crap going on, when you're not clear in terms of what you need to achieve, how you achieve, and the mistakes that, that you're making. Yeah. And I think it, and it gives it that safe environment to be open when you're seeing the other brothers do the same thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you've got a business, guys, and listening in, you know, having an outside perspective, when you set a standard of absolute truth, and I'm not talking about truth from a conceptual point of view, I'm talking about truth in terms of how we lie in our ego about what is actually going on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Brett, we're getting ready to wrap up. I just wanted to ask you before we, we do, what are you most excited about in your business at the moment? I'm most excited about the stage that I've got to in life where I don't need to work, that I can choose what I want to do. Um, I'm excited about um, more creativity now. So, you know, in my 60s, do I want to be working? Yeah, I want to, I want to do things that, help other people. I want to do things that make an impact. 
So, you know, Marie and I are writing a book at the moment around these principles that we're talking about. So I'm excited about getting that out. Um, I have a book that I wrote when I was sailing that I'm looking to publish uh, around a sailing journey. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited about, uh, as you know, I've gone ahead and bought a property in the US, a commercial yes. property to add to our portfolio and selling some of the stuff we have here in Australia. So I'm excited about the fact that we've you know, got investments that provide for us and I don't need to work. Um, I'm excited about sharing that experience by bringing other investors into that and, and growing, growing that. Um, I'm excited about my relationship with my gorgeous wife. It continues to <laughs> and grow and the fact that she continues to test me every single day of my life. <laughs> and make me a man by doing so, I might add. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I'm excited that, you know, I get to meet people like yourself and get to um, have the privilege of being part of your life, to share in your excitement about having um, your new baby coming on very, very soon. Yes, yes. And... Um, you know, to see you guys forge your relationship together and to be of assistance in that. So I'm excited about all those things. Yeah, it sounds like you've got a lot to be excited about. It's fantastic. Thank you. Um, where, so where can people go to find out more information about uh, you and the uh, Relationship Warriors and the, the Crucible? Where's the best place for them to find out more? Sure. So it's pretty easy. It's just Relationship Warrior, all one word, dot org, O-R-G. And uh, all the information that we've been talking about is, is available on that website. But, guys, if you're listening and you want to know more, um, use that website. Uh, look me up on social media, PM me. I'm more than happy to, you know, jump in and have a conversation with you about what's going on for you. Thanks so much for your time, Brett. Appreciate you being here. No, Nathaniel, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm always happy to, to talk about these subjects. Brilliant.